bothered by them occasionally, okay, but they're not really looking for drugs. So they don't stop you automatically if you have a tin can of marijuana with you. Right. But ever since I've been legal, I've always gone to the airport two hours early, even long before 9-11. Right. And now today, when I leave for Lauderdale, I always call the head of the police department at the airport, and we can advance. We give him my itinerary, tell him exactly what I'm on, and what time I'm going to security. They then send a letter out to the policeman in that area. And so if TSA does stop me and they call the police and they go, we've got a gentleman here, Irvin Rosenfeld, with a tin can of marijuana, the police will go, we know. He's legal. Thank you very much. Right. So I don't get bothered being people anymore. That's good. And I, and I have his private cell phone number, so if I were to get bothered going through New Hampshire Airport, you know, I'd show him all the information. Plus, thank God, with, you know, with, with the Internet now, you just Google my name. Right. And pull up thousands of articles on me and videos and everything else. So that usually suffices. doesn't, then I have the private cell phone numbers of the captain of the police department in my hometown, and again, the head of the police department at Fort Lauderdale International, I have his private cell phone number. Yeah. So, because again, it's only four of us in the country that have the right to do this. Right. So you can't, you can't blame police or TSA or whatever for being alarmed about it. You, know, you can't get upset. You can't say, I'm legal, you know, leave me alone. You've got to explain it. Hey, unusual circumstance, but it's, it's the way it is. Smoke cigarettes as well? No. Nope. Have you noticed any, any pulmonary issues? Any? Uh... The last time my lung capacity was checked, I uh, was 108 percent of normal. Oh, okay. Marijuana does not cause lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Studies have been done by the top physicians in the country, and they did a 10-year study, and they couldn't find one case of lung cancer due to the cannabis. In fact, really, it's a neuroprotectant. The study also pointed out that people who smoke cigarettes and cannabis had less cancers than the people that just smoke cigarettes. Wow. And, and I grew up in Virginia. So I, I joke with people, as a state law in Virginia, that once you become 15, it used to be that you had to smoke cigarettes. That's <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, true. <laughs> yeah, actually, being such a big tobacco state. Yeah, that's right. I actually so, have copies of that article, the, the study you're mentioning. I always leave them in the smoking lounge. Mm -hmm. Study finds no cancer marijuana connection. It's a Washington Post article. Dr. Donald right. Tashkin. Dr. Donald yep. Tashkin. Good guy. Great doctor. Okay. I mean, what I love about him, even though he was a main physician for 30 years to try to prove how bad cannabis is to the human body, his studies, he's honest. Meaning, here's his study, here's what he believes, he does his study and then reports the results. Right, wrong, and different, doesn't matter. Whatever the results are, that's what he reports. So I appreciate that, he's an honest position, you know, and I like that. So, as he said, he said, yeah, I really thought it caused lung cancer, I couldn't find one case of it. I was wrong, and he admitted it. So it's a sugar study. Yeah. I have smoked forever, and I went to the doctor the other day, Thing on my finger. My oxygen <coughs> saturation was 95%. My blood pressure is normal. My cholesterols are good. And my MS started in 1976. Mm. And the first thing that gave me any help with the fear mm -hmm. was cannabis. Well, I don't recommend for anybody to smoke well, cigarettes. But yeah. I do tell people if they do smoke cigarettes, they should smoke cannabis. Yeah. Also. Like you have to. And with college students here, I'll point out something else, okay? Which I, I speak to a lot of college campuses. And I'll take a look at uh, you two, okay? You are a procrastinator. A month ago, a month ago, 
a, a, a professor gave you a paper to write. Yep. It's due tomorrow, Monday, and it's Sunday at noon. And you went, oh crap, I forgot all about that paper I gotta write. You go and smoke a joint, maybe even two of them. Then you sit down, you write your paper, you make some corrections the next morning, and you hand it in. You have it exactly. You're in the same <laughs> class he's in. You're in the same class he's in. Okay, Absolutely. you're in the same class. It's Sunday at noon, you go, oh God, I forgot all about that paper. You go smoke a joint, and then you go, oh man, screw it, I don't feel like writing that paper. You're giving me a bad name. Meaning, cannabis harms you, it makes you a vegetable, it makes you where you don't want to do anything, you're lethargic. Nothing wrong with that. Just don't ever do it unless you can afford to be lethargic. Right, exactly. Be somewhere where you don't, it doesn't matter. Okay, but if you've got work to do, it messes you up. You, it enhances your thought process. It doesn't harm you at all. So fine, God bless you, you do it. But you've got to know what cannabis does to you. Okay, and if it harms you in any way, then don't, don't put yourself in harm's way. Because if you do, and something happens, then what I'm trying to do out here gives me a bad name. I've got to answer for you. I don't like that. You know? Yeah, I just wish I could go to a store and buy, like, know what I'm buying. Because, mm -hmm. like, certain varieties tend to help me do school work and put in that state of mind, but right. others are immediate couch potatoes. So yes, really sativa nice and indica makes a difference. Yeah, yeah it'd be really nice yep. to have that. Mm -hmm. It would be, and one day hopefully that will happen, but yeah. until then, <laughs> until then, you know, just know that cannabis is just cannabis. Yeah. And if anything, any way any cannabis harms you, then never put yourself in that position. You know, the, the bill originally in New Hampshire originally um, covered post-traumatic stress syndrome, and that was stripped out of it. That was a big disappointment, I think, for a lot of people, because we were hoping that we could become part of the groundbreaking um, research and development that's going on. Um, mm -hmm. Now all they do is put you on, on clonopin and send you on your way, and, and we're hoping that, that that could be part of it. So it was a disappointment that that got stripped out. Well, again, I would you know state to your representatives, the Veterans Administration, who better to say whether it's a medicine or not for your veteran? And they say it is. Yep. So why do you know more than the Veterans Administration? You know, you ask them that. Yep. And of course, I always ask them why do you know more? Why do you think you know more than the American Medical Association or the American Nurses Association? When they sanction. So yeah, PTS is definitely a disorder, and it works. Israel's studying it. Israel's using it for that reason, and I think all you know other countries are looking into it. Yep. And this country should, you know, and they are. You know, other states, other states, it's allowed. <coughs> but again, that, yes, and again, veterans are going to do it anyway. Once they learn, they're going to do it anyway. They, whether you have a law saying they can do it or not, yep. are they going to worry about breaking a law? They fought a war. They killed people. They're going to worry about some kind of words on a paper saying that they're a criminal. So if that's a needed medicine, they should be able to use it. The, now the pharmaceutical industry, do you think that some of their opposition to this is because they want the market, they want to get, they want to bring it into pill form and make the money well, that de way? Well, definitely that's the case. I mean, they, they want it only substantiated by FDA. And they make it sound like that before there was FDA, there was never a medicine in this country. You know, until FDA sanctioned it. So the pharmaceutical industry does not want to see anything that can be, that you can do without using them. And the problem with this is you can go home and grow your own. And that's one of the major problems that the pharmaceutical industry has. With it's true. You can empower yourself for your own treatment rather than exactly. going to them. Exactly. And so that's one of the major problems that the, that the pharmaceutical industry has with this. Mostly from our favorite chief of police, but you know, various other people is, you know, they can't have a medical marijuana law because then there'll be medical marijuana in the parents' houses and the kids will get a hold of it. And you say, well, but without it, they can get a hold of their parents' morphine tablets or Oxycontin tablets or whatever. So if they're going to get in their parents' medicine cabinet, would you rather them get a hold of the marijuana or would you rather them get a hold of the Oxy? But that's still they never have an answer for that. Right, but. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's still... I'm not in favor of anybody in their formative years using an illegal substance. I don't think they should. But if a qualified physician believes that a underage person needs this medicine, then that's, that's their job. Sure. Well, I mean, the way I look at it is they don't, they don't say... Are you more or are you more? Right? And they don't say to a two-and-a-half-year-old, well, you know, you've got cancer, and I'd like to use chemotherapy, but you're too young. Yeah, they don't do that. They go, no, you're going to go through chemotherapy. Well, then why do you say that they're too young to use a medicine that might take the nausea away from them? But yet they're not too young to go through chemotherapy. Or to be prescribed in phenomenes. I mean, right, right. Adderall, Ritalin, you know, all that. Oh, yeah. That's, 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 that's oh, Ritalin, yeah. they hand it out like candy. It's cool, yeah, exactly. you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Much it's much for your Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, my, my little uh, nephew, creative kid, just 
all over the place. Get that, get him on Ritalin, uh, you know, so he can kind of just shut up and get in line at school, you know? Well, there's been, there's been many cases of kids, you know, with autism and things like that that have come around with cannabis where they haven't known anything else. Yeah. And one in particular, a, a kid named Joey, a 10-year-old kid that, again, very artistic, <coughs> and he basically uh, couldn't go to any schools. He was killing himself, knocking his head against the wall, things like that, stopped eating. He had lost half his body weight, and the doctors just told his mother, just take him home and he'll die. And his mother put him on cannabis. Well, what happens when you start using cannabis? You get the munchies, most people do. So he started eating. So he put his body weight back on. Another thing that happens with cannabis is you aren't mean anymore, you aren't mad. So he stopped hitting his head against the wall. Okay. And then this kid, 10 years old, had never spoken a word in his life. Well, when you get high, what else happens to you? You start chatting, you start talking. And you start talking for the first time. All because of cannabis. And he had, she had to go to court because they were trying to take the kid away from her because she, she was taking, giving him cannabis. Wow. And she won that court battle, luckily. So, you know, people just, they believe the hysteria that's been taught to them all their lives. And I don't blame them. I thought it was, I, I thought it was dangerous too. I was so different. Until I started using it. And then I realized this is not dangerous. It's been on Irv, I notice you're smoking as opposed to having like a capsule of cannabis that you're consuming. Uh, right. A lot of the police chiefs uh, that are dissenting with the current legislation are saying, oh, well, if it's not a pill, it's clearly not medicine. Can you explain why it is that smoking it would be more beneficial than consuming it for some people? Right. When you smoke cannabis, you titrate it. You get the effects of it almost immediately. So if you've got a medical problem and you're taking it for that reason, then once that medical problem clears up, you stop taking it. You don't need it anymore. You put it out. Where a pill, you can't titrate as well, meaning it goes to your system, it goes through your liver, it takes 40, 45 minutes for it to react. And then some people think, what's well, not working, let me take another. And then all of a sudden, both of them hit you and you overdose, you take too much, and you go to sleep, is what happens. So smoking really is the best form or vaporization. I don't have a vaporizer with me, so I don't vaporize when I'm traveling, especially. So smoking is the easiest way, and it's the best way to get to your system. And again, it does no harm to lungs at all. People won't believe that it does, because you're smoking. Well, you're smoking cigarettes, it might do harm to the lungs, but smoking cannabis clears your lungs up. So, uh, smoking is the best way of delivering. Wait, wait, wait. Senator. Hey, what's going on? How you been? Interesting. Um, with, you know, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I didn't, it was like I diagnosed on a Thursday, into surgery and so forth, the following Tuesday, I didn't have time to, to get involved or anything like that, but I had to, um, I had to sneak out behind my house because everyone was against marijuana. I had to sneak out behind my garage before uh, before my um, uh, radiation treatment and, and I'll do smoking. Right. And, I, and I hadn't realized that. Like, what am I? Why do I have to do this? Look, if I have cancer, um, I, I'm, I'm my mar marijuana is working better than my sixteen hundred dollar prescription for Zofran. Right. And I'm hiding behind my garage so my mother-in-law doesn't see me exactly. smoking. It was ridiculous, you know. And that's kind of what propelled me into the into activism, you know, it's so... Uh, it yeah, well, when, once facing a, a life-threatening uh, disability or a life-threatening disorder, it brings one to the realization that, hey, this is just a plant. It's all it is, okay? And I gotta go through cancer, it's like, and you wanna make me a criminal because I'm using this? So that's what people have to realize, and also people have to realize that diseases, you know something, they don't know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. They have no idea. So it hits everybody, it's all families. That's what really makes me realize that you know people should understand that everybody should be in favor of this, okay? It should be controlled, nothing wrong with that. But take your situation, okay? The way this law is written, it wouldn't help you from what I've read about this law, meaning you were diagnosed on a Thursday and Wednesday you were in? Uh, yeah, the following Tuesday. Okay, following the, Tuesday, okay. Knife, yeah. Gee, you have four days to grow plants? Yeah. Okay, that's why, <laughs> you know. That's yeah. why you need, you need a way to be able to go and say, God, I just got diagnosed with this. They're telling me I've got to go through radiation in four days. You know, and they're telling me, my doctor's telling me if I get the cannabis, it might take away the nausea and you can go to buy some, you know, or with a doctor's recommendation. Because you don't have time to grow. I've never grown a plant in my life. I wouldn't have to grow it. I mean, the federal government grows it. Okay, so I don't have to grow it. And the feds wouldn't allow me to grow it, first of all. I'd be breaking the law, just like everybody else would. Hey, Herb, I want to introduce you to Gary Lambert. He's a senator. He's on Health and Human Service Committee, uh, a Marine, and he was opposed, and then he supported it this year. Yeah, Gary, so turn it around on the committee. Very good. Nice to meet Thank, you. Nice to meet you. Thank Definitely. you.
And one of the important aspects I was telling him is with the Veterans Administration. Okay, my organization, Patients Out of Time, we're the only organization in the United States that's sanctioned by the American Medical Association and the American Nurses Association to teach doctors and nurses about medical cannabis to where they get continuing education credit to come to our conference or download our previous conference. We do it every two years, which was in Rhode Island two years ago. They get continuing education. We've also got new Veterans Administration to come out in favor of it. Now what the Veterans Administration states is this, which is very important, is if a veteran is taking OxyContin, any kind of opiates, and they go to a VA center, and they take a blood test or urinalysis, and they test positive for metabolites of cannabis, the VA has instructed their doctors to withdraw treatment of that veteran, take away the opiates, withdraw, make, withdraw. Unless you're in a state that allows it. If you're in a state that allows it, <coughs> you're fine. No problem. Just because you have cannabis in your system. We still, we still, we still, we still treat you. So what I'm saying is it's, it's, it's not right. Where a veteran in Florida where I live, or in Virginia where I grew up, and same here with New Hampshire, isn't afforded the same rights as veterans in 17 other states, a third of this country. So what I like to say to politicians is, you know, we talk about medical cannabis as a medicine, this, that, and the other, and I've argued this for 40 years, okay, 30 years legally. But now I'm going to argue this. Senator, let me ask you a question. Why are you against our veterans? And if, you, if, the, if there's no law in the state, then you are literally against veterans because they're not afforded the same treatment as other states. So that right there to me is a compelling argument that politicians are, should be in favor of veterans, should say, what can I do to help? Okay, if this is what you want, if this is what the VA says we need to do, then we need to do it. Because what's right for our veterans is what's right for our state. Yeah, I'm the chairman of the Veterans Affairs right. Committee, also a retired Marine. Mm -hmm. uh, can you send me a copy of where the VA is on board? I mean, I support the medical marijuana. I voted okay. against it before, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But then I came back and I voted against the veto and supported it this year. Mm -hmm. But I have some issues with it, even though I'm supporting it. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, the, when you're driving under the influence, mm -hmm. okay, any test, uh, how, how do we handle that? Well, my federal protocol says that I'm allowed to operate dangerous machinery as long as I'm not intoxicated. Now, I get no high off cannabis. I never have. It's very unusual. Okay, it's not the norm. Okay. So when I'm stopped by a police officer, and they tell me I can't drive with this, and I show them the protocol, I go, am I intoxicated? They go, no. So again, your police officers are trained to be able to tell if somebody's intoxicated or not. A blood test doesn't work. If it shows metabolites in your system, that's because cannabis can stay in your system for over 30 days, if not longer. Because see, we, ha we have natural cannabinoid receptors all throughout our body. We manufacture natural cannabis. The THC content you're talking about. Well, the THC stays that stay, it stays in your system. It's almost like I try to explain. People like to compare alcohol with, with cannabis. Now, let's say it's exactly the same. Exactly the same substance, basically. Okay, today is Tuesday. Okay? Saturday, a week ago, I had three drinks. Today, if they test me, and alcohol is the same as cannabis, I'm drunk. Because it's in my system. But I had a drink eight days ago. So, you know I'm not drunk. But my blood work says I'm drunk. That's the problem with cannabis. You could have smoked cannabis nine days ago, but your blood work's going to show you're high. So you, what you need to do is train who's in charge, such as your police officers, is to be able to tell, which is what they do on prescription drugs and other, other medicines, whether they're intoxicated or not. Well, we have here in New Hampshire the laws in the books that cover um, drugs, or, you know, if you're driving under the influence or uh, driving in danger of crossing the yellow line. So we have sure. laws. Yeah. That's, that's, that's it's the same thing. They're behavior-based. It's just, based. Right. It's just like it's just like any prescription. Any it's you're just like any prescription. Drive well impaired on any substance, yes. whether it's oxycontin. So my question was on when I voted, I closed my eyes on that one because I'm saying, are we going to add to the court system now? You and, know, and, and, and you know, some sir, sir, let me just speak about uh, cannabis driving versus alcohol. And when you drive on alcohol, you're fine. Nothing's wrong. I can drive. I'm nothing wrong with me. I'm great. When you drive high, first of all, people don't plan to drive high. Very few people plan to drive high. People that normally don't get high or whatever go to a party and all of a sudden they get high, which is unusual, let's say. And now, oh God, I gotta drive. Well, they're thinking, I'm high, I've gotta drive, and I don't want to, but I do. So you know how you can tell a lot of times whether somebody's driving high? Is they come up to a stop sign, and they stop, and they wait for it to turn green. Well, Meaning they're extra cautious. They're extra cautious because they know they're high. That's like, the difference. I would like to give you my card with my email. And I'd like to see the veteran inside. Give it to Matt. It's, all, it's on our website. It's on our website. six years and I've never seen anything come through my committee on veteran support. Well, that's why I'm letting you know. It's, right. it's through my organization, Patients at a Time. 
which the website's medicalcannabis.com. And see, the importance is my organization, like I'm not even a member of MPP, okay, they brought me up here. My organization is Patients at a Time. We're completely medical. What they do is they do the lobby work. They do what they do. We do the medical. They don't have experts. We're the experts. So what we, we, we try to work together. We don't lobby. My organization has no paid members. We have no, no membership per se, but we are the experts in the United States and the world for that matter. At our conference last week in Tucson, we had doctors from Germany, from South America, from England, from Portugal. All the top cannabinoid researchers all come to our conference and testify. That's well, what I'm we're saying. But I got to tell you, we got to get three more senators. Well, get me in front of anybody. Around, get so. me in front of anybody you think you can. Yeah, I'll be here until 2:30. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Definitely. Thanks nice for coming out. You too. But I definitely am looking for it because for future use, you gave him a hard. That's my guy. I'm just getting on your line. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I hate to break up this party. We got to get to a radio station right now. I'm sure we'll be back in this room later today. <laughs>